A continuación, en Armas de Guerra. De más de 60 toneladas de peso, aún pueden ser maniobrados sobre cualquier terreno con gran rapidez y agilidad. Con armas que pueden acabar con la armada enemiga a 2 kilómetros de distancia. Estas increíbles maravillas tecnológicas evolucionaron a partir de las pesadas máquinas de guerra de la Primera Guerra Mundial. Obtuvieron amargas victorias en cada frente de la Segunda Guerra y se desplazaron decisivamente sobre las arenas del Medio Oriente. Los tanques, a continuación, en armas de guerra. En 1482, Leonardo da Vinci escribió, estoy construyendo carruajes asegurados y cubiertos invulnerables, y cuando se desplacen entre los adversarios hasta los mayores enemigos, se retirarán. Casi 400 años después, el carruaje armado de Leonardo rugía sobre el hostil terreno del frente oriental, y su evolución conllevó a las tácticas a explotar su enorme poder de fuego. Con estrategas como Geradian, Patton y Rommel, el tanque surgió como el arma dominante de la batalla en tierra. Las armadas que marcharon en la Primera Guerra Mundial estaban más preparadas para el uso de mosquetes y en la caballería. Los patrones de la guerra han cambiado poco desde el siglo XIX. Largas filas de trincheras, Intrincadas líneas defensivas de alambre de púas. Masas de lodo revueltas por el fuego de la artillería. Y breves y a menudo futiles ataques de infantería, donde el avance se metía más seguido en yardas que en millas. Estas fueron las circunstancias que llevaron a la evolución del tanque. In the early days of the war, the uh, Allied forces did use armored cars, particularly to rescue down pilots. But as the static situation developed, trenches, barbed wire, obviously armored cars could not cross this type of terrain. So tanks were developed in order to cross a terrain swept by machine gun fire, covered in barbed wire, and covered in very deep trenches, which armored cars could clearly not operate in. Winston Churchill, primer caballero del almirantazgo británico, apoyó el desarrollo de las naves terrestres diseñadas a partir de los tractores de granjas que inspiraron los primeros experimentos secretos que por seguridad llamaron tanques. Well, the word tank came in fact as a cover story during the First World War when they were developing these vehicles and they did tend to look like water tanks. So, so people did not know exactly what they were, they just happened to call them tanks uh, and that name was stuck right through this day. The very first British tank was called Little Willie, and that actually was a full-track vehicle with just a very large superstructure, but it did prove the basic concept. In December of 1915, the first tank British tank, the Mark I, was released from the laboratory. It was called Grand Willie or Madre. This was the first of a series of British tanks of a rhomboidal form. La producción comenzó en febrero de 1916 y en julio el primer tanque del mundo entró a la acción en la batalla de Somme. Estos primeros tanques pesaban 31 toneladas y tenían una velocidad máxima de menos de 8 kilómetros por hora. De los ocho miembros del equipo, 
cuatro se encargaban de maniobrarlo. El alcance de los tanques era de solo 30 kilómetros. Las mejoras de la coraza y del armamento continuaron a lo largo de la guerra. El diseño más común era el Mark IV. Más de 1.200 Mark IV fueron construidos. Los tanques fueron hechos en dos versiones, macho y hembra. El macho poseía dos cañones de 6 libras y la hembra cuatro metralletas. Los franceses también fueron pioneros en el desarrollo de los tanques. El Renault FT-17, conocido como Mosquito, fue uno de los primeros diseños más importantes. Pesaba menos de 5 toneladas, por lo que podía ser transportado en camiones. Esto facilitaba su despliegue y ayudaba a prevenir las rupturas de los camiones, un problema frecuente con los primeros tanques. El FT fue el primer vehículo blindado que adaptó a la forma moderna del tanque una torre giratoria, un motor posterior y una superestructura de vanguardia. En driving the old Renault one man battle tank, it was a feeling that you were invincible because you could hear the bullets hit the sides and you felt invincible and you could go right over the wire because it was powerful enough to tear the wire loose from the steel stanchions it was uh, wound into and they were very effective infantry loved them they always welcomed them because if they had a specially tough machine gun nest that were going to take a lot of men and a lot of lives to get probably You can run right on up to it, just like your thumb and your nose out and go right on up to it and shoot right into the aperture and clean them out. The sensation of driving one of these things is terrible because it's terribly confining. And the, the engine, you're practically sitting on the engine, and the noise of the engine, the noise of the guns and the, rec uh, the concussions outside the tank, And the general, it, it's like being in a maelstrom of noise and racket and, and discomfort. It's terribly hot, and uh, you're just tickle pink to get the damn thing back to where you can park it and get out of it. En noviembre de 1917, en la batalla de Cambrai, los 400 tanques británicos se concentraron para un asalto masivo. Siendo la primera vez que los mismos eran usados no solo como apoyo a la infantería, sino para iniciar un ataque. So there was a, a continual debate in the development of the tank as to whether it was an infantry weapon that was absolutely, uh, it existed to support the individual infantryman in taking his objective, or was it a, a new, significantly different form of, of uh, battlefield capability that should in its own right be supported to strike deep, achieve objectives that were beyond the, the, the imagination of, of the, the individual infantryman. Para finales de la guerra, los ingleses construyeron más de 2.300 tanques de 13 diseños diferentes. Los franceses construyeron más de 4.000 tanques pesados y livianos. Sin embargo, los alemanes construyeron solo 20. Su diseño requería un equipo de 18 hombres. El programa de tanques estadounidenses estaba en sus comienzos para finales de la guerra. El Mark 8 fue diseñado para ganar la guerra de 1919. El cuerpo estadounidense luchó en tanques británicos y franceses. El primer comandante estadounidense de tanques dejaría una huella en las futuras batallas. Su nombre era George Patton. Cuando finalizó la euforia que marcó el final de la guerra, igualmente disminuyó el interés en la producción de tanques. El excedente de vehículos fue destinado a depósitos de chatarra. En todo el mundo aún había muchos pioneros interesados en el diseño y tácticas de los tanques, aunque la gran mayoría eran ignorados. 
In France, it was de Gaulle. In uh, Germany, Guderian. In uh, Britain, it was Liddell Hart, JFC Fuller. Uh, they saw the tanks as more than mechanized cavalry, uh, but still in a, an important cavalry role in which you would puncture the enemy lines, get behind it, uh, not worry about your flanks, uh, capture communications, ups, disorganize the enemy. And also they saw them operated in force. They, they didn't see them operated in ones and twos. It was an amazing thing that in every country there were people who had the right idea about how to employ tanks and wrote about how to employ tanks and were read by their counterparts in other countries who understood them and who all universally were ignored in their own countries. A finales de los años 20, un brillante diseñador, Walter Christie, Creó un tanque más liviano y más veloz, que podía correr a campo traviesa a velocidad sorprendente, sobre una barra de suspensión revolucionaria. La Armada de Estados Unidos compró algunos de los tanques de Christie, pero básicamente el país ignoró sus ideas. El T-3 de Christie incluía orugas removibles, lo que permitía al tanque desplazarse sobre cuatro ruedas para un recorrido más rápido. Back in the days when tanks went 13 miles an hour, Christie claimed that this one could go 125, and it probably would go 125. The Army tested it out at 70 miles an hour on the wheels, and the Army got it up to about 40 miles an hour on the tracks. He sold it to the Russians. And if you take a look at this suspension system, the, uh, the Christie suspension system, and you take a look at the Russian VT series, or even better still, the uh, T-34, you'll see it's nothing more than the Christie suspension system. And the, the, the uh, Christie suspension system stays the basic suspension system for the Soviet Army right up to the T-62 tank that they produced in the, in the 60s. Para finales de los años 30, la Armada estadounidense tenía el decimonoveno lugar. Carecía ampliamente de hombres y equipos. El presupuesto total para el desarrollo de los tanques era de 85 mil dólares al año. La fuerza mecanizada incluía vehículos de pasajeros armados y líderes visionarios como George Patton y Adna Chaffee. Promovieron juegos de guerra para atraer la atención de los medios de comunicación y recaudar fondos para mejorar la fuerza. Se hizo énfasis en tanques de apoyo a la infantería ligeros y rápidos. El M2 fue conocido por su diseño de doble torre y fue llamado My West por razones obvias. El tanque estaba ligeramente blindado y armado y por suerte jamás tuvo que demostrar sus capacidades en el frente. El M2 evolucionó al tanque liviano M3, rápido y confiable, y se convirtió en el primero en participar en una guerra. It's a light tank, has a 37 mm gun, very fast. The, uh, the British call it the honey because it was a honey of a tank. They used it in North Africa to maneuver to the flanks and to the rear of the Italians and the German tanks uh, to shoot them from the rear. The problem with the, the tank is that it, it's uh, very, very lightly armored and could only be used really in a scouting role. You can't use it in a slugging match with armor. You have to maneuver at very high speeds to keep the other guy from shooting you. Segunda Guerra Mundial, 1939-1945. El 20 de abril de 1938, para celebrar el 50 aniversario de Hitler, el partido nazi orgullosamente mostró sus armas de guerra. El Tratado de Versalles había prohibido a Alemania la producción de tanques. Sin embargo, la producción de prototipos continuó bajo el nombre de tractores para esconder su identidad. Luego, cuando los nazis se hicieron líderes en la producción de los vehículos de campo blindados, los diseños se concentraban en el poder de fuego de los tanques. En Blitzkrieg, la guerra relámpago, altas concentraciones de tanques que avanzaban por las líneas enemigas, destruían las posiciones de suministros y artillerías y acababan con los enemigos renuentes a rendirse. 
con los devastadores ataques en Polonia y Europa Oriental en 1939, los alemanes demostraron el valor de su estrategia. La misma estrategia promovida por los británicos años antes y perfeccionada por los líderes alemanes como Heinz Gitarian y Erwin Rommel. Blitzkrieg demostró que las tácticas superiores prevalecerían sobre cualquier arma. Prior to the invasion of France in 1940, in fact, the British and French had more tanks than the Germans. Some of our tanks were very good, but we did not know really how to use our tanks. We tended to spread them too thin, where the Germans would concentrate their armor and use it en masse. We had the tanks, we had the artillery, but we could not really use them as a combined arms team. Therefore, we lost the Battle of France. Con Blitzkrieg, los alemanes convirtieron al tanque en el arma dominante de la guerra en tierra y los hombres que guiaban los Panzer se convirtieron en los más temidos de la tierra. We always talk about equipment. It is the motivation of the man, how he's trained, how he's led. And that certainly had a major part to play of the effectiveness of the German army. They were well led, they were well motivated. Perhaps some of the allied countries, perhaps as France, they did not have that same motivation or backup the German soldier had. Pero, inevitablemente, con los triunfos llegan las tragedias, tanto para los vencedores como para los vencidos. En la campaña del norte de África, Erwin Rommel y su cuerpo africano sufrieron una baja brutal durante una lucha con Montgomery y los británicos. Los alemanes continuaron mejorando sus vehículos de campo Panzer con mayores armas y blindaje. Estos tanques eran formidables, pero los diseños eran complejos y difíciles de producir y mantener. En 1942 crearon el legendario tanque Tigre de 56 toneladas. Era una máquina de asombroso poder, pero era lenta y a menudo poco confiable. Los británicos contaban con sus propios tanques livianos como el Crusader y el Matilda. Aunque posteriormente se dirigieron a Estados Unidos en busca de mayor fuerza en sus armas. La capacidad de producción masiva de la industria automotriz estadounidense estaba concentrada para satisfacer las necesidades de la manufactura de tanques de los aliados. En abril de 1941, menos de siete meses después del comienzo de la construcción de la fábrica, el primer tanque M3 mediano fue entregado. Conocidos como el General Grant y el General Lee, los tanques fueron enviados rápidamente a los británicos en África del Norte. Estaban armados con cañones de 75 milímetros montados lateralmente, no en la torre. One of the first tanks used by the British Army from the American under the Lend-Lease program was the Grant and Lee. Automotively, it was a very good tank. They couldn't develop one with a turret at that time for a number of technical reasons. So in order to get a vehicle in production, they had to put the gun in a sponson on one side, like the First World War tanks. But this had a number of tactical limitations, as found out by the British in some of the North African battles. Particularly, we had a problem in engaging targets over a wide arc. The, the driver had to change direction in order to lay the gun on the target. In 1942, el general George Patton y sus fuerzas de combate se unieron a la campaña del norte de África con los tanques M3. Rommel escribió que el adviento del nuevo tanque estadounidense había creado grandes vacíos en sus filas. Sin embargo, el trabajo de diseño continuó para mejorar los tanques medianos. 
los estadounidenses habían descubierto las deficiencias del M3. Después de muchas batallas históricas, los aliados posteriormente vencieron a Rommel y a sus cuerpos africanos. We outnumbered him. He did use his tanks to a better advantage and certainly did give the British a good run for their money on many occasions. But his supply lines were very long. So in the end, he didn't have enough fuel, ammunition was short, and he was eventually pushed out of North Africa. En el frente oriental, los veloces tanques soviéticos T-34 sorprendieron a los alemanes por su rapidez y maniobrabilidad. En respuesta a esto, los alemanes desarrollaron el tanque Pantera de 50 toneladas, que junto al T-34 es considerado uno de los mejores tanques de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. En Estados Unidos, el nuevo tanque mediano M4 Sherman comenzó a producirse. Antes del fin de la guerra, 50.000 de estos tanques serán entregados. Poseía un cañón principal de 75 milímetros, ubicado en una torre motorizada, capaz de rotar 360 grados. La tracción tenía un excelente diseño de goma, permitiendo a los cinco integrantes del equipo conducirlo tanto en el campo como en las carreteras. El Sherman fácil de maniobrar era fuerte, confiable, fácil de producir y sencillo de mantener. Los Sherman pelearon casi para todas las armadas aliadas en casi todos los escenarios de la guerra. El tanque Sherman es considerado uno de los más importantes vehículos blindados de la historia. After what we had gone through, it was, it was like a blessing. I mean, we couldn't, some of us would stay in it all night just to get acquainted with it. It was, it was a delight. It was brand new and it had uh, everything we'd been missing. Pero durante la batalla, el equipo de los tanques pronto descubrió que el Sherman también tenía deficiencias considerables. La coraza era muy delgada y el cañón muy pequeño, comparado con los tanques alemanes Rey Tigre y Pantera. En Normandy, si you sent tres o cuatro Shermans after a Panther, you might well knock out the Panther, but you'll probably lose three or Shermans, because the Panther had much better armor protection and a much better gun. The Panther had a gun, uh, a Pack 42 75 mm gun which would develop right at 3,300 foot-second muzzle velocity. Compare that with our Sherman tank, this little M275, which was 2,050 foot-second muzzle velocity. That means that, that that tank, that gun could go all the way through our tank and out the other side. Uh, and, and, and we couldn't even get through the front of that tank. We could outrun them. We could outshoot them on a straight run. But we could never, very, very seldom knock them out. Because our, like they showed, the, they would just bounce right off the tanks. If you hit them in the front, forget it. They would just smash that shell in, in pieces and wouldn't even penetrate. It's an awful feeling, I'll tell you that. You're shooting and and it's bouncing off of them, and they, they they're firing at you, and they're going through you like a, a hot knife through butter. I felt like that we had been victims of a of a tragic uh, misunderstanding because I had been to tank school. I'd seen the M4 Sherman tank, and I'd been told that that was the best tank going, and I believed it. I believed it better than German tanks. I didn't know that German tanks were like they were. Uh, our men went into Normandy believing that those tanks were good and that they were equal to or better than German tanks. When we got in there, it was a real tragedy to see it was the other way around. Our division had fantastic losses. We lost 87 tanks going the first seven miles through those hedgerows. It was just horrendous. Otro problema del Sherman era que el depósito de municiones era de poca calidad, 
así que el tanque podía incendiarse fácilmente. El equipo posteriormente lo llamó encendedor Ronson porque siempre encendía al primer intento. Durante la campaña europea, las pérdidas en el Sherman eran tremendas. Nuevos tanques llegaron de Estados Unidos, pero nuevos hombres debían ser entrenados. They brought down about three truckloads of raw infantry replacements. These kids had just gotten off the, the, the boat from Antwerp, and they'd only had basic training. They brought them down there. We asked with any tank drivers amongst them, no tank drivers, nobody ever had trained in tank at all. We had 17 tanks to issue out, which was equivalent to a whole company, and we put them in the tanks, and we got our artillery sergeants to teach them how to fire the main gun. And each man got to fire that gun three times, and that's all the training they had. And we issued those tanks out about 5.30 or 6 o'clock that night. Went down there again about 8 o'clock that night or later. And of those 17 tanks, 15 of them were knocked out on the side of the road. I don't know whether any of those men survived or not, but I thought that was a real tragedy that we'd had to send those young men into battle without any training at all because of the tremendous losses we'd taken prior to that. A pesar de las pérdidas, el número de Sherman prevalecía. It was a, a magnificent testament to American industry that we were able to produce the quality that was the quantity of the Sherman tank in a relatively short period of time. But it was a situation of having to literally use your wits because basically you were outgunned and you were outarmored. I had a, uh, what was called a short barrel 75. The main advantage being that you could go between trees, whereas long barrels get hung up. We, we caught Germans because their, their, their guns were so long that they couldn't, you know, they couldn't swing between trees, you know. So whenever we saw that they were in between trees, then we'd go around the side and try to get them through that turret, which was very good. We liked that. Se desarrollaron modificaciones ingeniosas. Un tanque lanza cohetes, un lanza llamas. Los británicos crearon una versión de barreminas. Un tanque tractor fue utilizado para abrir la espesa maleza de Normandía, tan pronto como fue creado un mejor cortagramas. It meant that instead of the Germans being able to say, well, they know that the breakthrough is going to come where we had a, a bulldozer. But with these hedge choppers, they were so low to the ground, the Germans couldn't tell whether the tank was equipped with the hedge chopper or not. So the result of that, instead of being able to break through at two or three places, we were able to break through 10 or 12 places at one time. And it was extremely effective. Incluso a través de la amarga batalla de Bolt, el Sherman demostró ser confiable. Con la ayuda de la Fuerza Aérea Coordinada y de personal ingenioso, el Sherman posteriormente fue conocido como el tanque que ganó la guerra. Pero aún así, sus hombres se sentían afortunados de haber sobrevivido. I feel lucky and I uh, prayed a lot. As a matter of fact, I carry the rosary beads that my mother gave me, and to this day they're in my jacket. I still use them. And uh, I think that helped me get through it. I really do. Oh, I'm damn lucky that uh, I'm here today. I only, I only got a couple of scratches. Outside of that, uh, everything was pretty good. A lot of my buddies never made it. Never made it back. I'm getting goose pimples. Al final de la Segunda Guerra, la doctrina de los tanques no había sido escrita. El debate sobre si los tanques debían iniciar el ataque o apoyar la infantería aún ardía. Y el futuro conflicto de Corea hizo poco para resolver el problema. Guerra de Corea, 1950-1953.
the terrain limited somewhat the use of the tank in Korea. The enemy tanks were limited by the fact they were suppressed by our air power. Simply, when they appeared, they were eradicated by, by the superior air power. American tanks weren't able to be employed in the classic manner as, as they had been in the past because the Korean mountain passes and so forth dictated that they move along the roads. But they're still important and, and forced back into the, the original role that the British had employed upon them as uh, augmenting the, the troops as a um, as a means of uh, uh, providing local firepower and local protection to the troops. Los mejores tanques Sherman, los M26 Pershing y los M24 Chaffee fueron desplegados en Corea. A menudo su función se limitaba a aumentar la batería de la artillería. On the other side, the North Koreans use mainly Russian tanks, particularly the T-34. When the T-34s came across the border, the Americans really were taken aback because they couldn't knock them out. They'd lost the edge. Their bazookas could not take out some of the Russian tanks used by the North Koreans and then later the Chinese. But really, the Korean campaign was really an infantry campaign. The terrain didn't suit highly mobile operations. You could certainly use tanks to push forward, but there were not many tank via tank operations. Después de la guerra, Estados Unidos experimentó una serie de tanques ultra pesados con cañones de más de 155 milímetros. Muchos eran demasiado aparatosos para operaciones rutinarias. El T-95 pesaba 100 toneladas. Los soviéticos igualmente continuaron desarrollando los vehículos blindados con modificaciones en los tanques T-34 y K-5. En 1952, Estados Unidos introdujo el tanque mediano M48 Patton para reemplazar al Sherman. Este fue el tanque más importante de Estados Unidos durante la guerra de Vietnam. Guerra de Vietnam, 1964-1973. When the American army first deployed to Vietnam, it was widely thought the tank had no role there. But once offensive operations started, it was soon realized that tanks did have a role. And M48 tanks were sent out there, and also the Vietnamese were given tanks, particularly M48s. And those tanks were get used in offensive operations to provide fire support and to break down the bush for the infantry to go through. First and foremost, Vietnam was, was truly the infantryman's war. The role of armor was one of, of supporting the infantryman in the accomplishment of his mission. Uh, traditionally, the infantry had literally done the, the, the bread and butter attack while armor forces went around the flank, got into the enemy's rear and, and what have you, working potentially with airborne forces. In Vietnam, you had a, a role reversal in that the armored forces, because of their firepower and their mobility in many parts of the country, were able to basically keep the pressure on while infantry, now helicopter mounted, could move decisively to engage the enemy at times and places unanticipated by the enemy. A pesar de su uso limitado, muchos tipos de vehículos blindados fueron desplegados en Vietnam. Los tanques M48 Sheridan y Walker Bulldogs pelearon junto con los transportes de tropa armados M113. Vietnam was a challenging time to be in the mounted force. Your feeling was that, that uh, in any group uh, you tend to draw fire. In other words, because of the capability, uh, you instantly become a target for anything that the enemy has that they think is sufficiently good to, to, to get you, as opposed to getting to the infantrymen that may be walking to your side. Tanks did play a vital role in, in Vietnam, and on retrospect, perhaps they should have been used there rather earlier than they were done at the end of the day. El tanque M60 evolucionó a partir del M48, convirtiéndose en el principal tanque de batalla estadounidense. A pesar de su diseño de 30 años de edad, fue muy útil en la guerra del Golfo en 1991, con las mejoras electrónicas y con el blindaje reactivo explosivo. Until fairly recently, all tanks had basically steel armor. 
to improve survivability, you got it, you made it thicker. But in recent years, there have been a number of programs to improve the survivability of tanks. One is the development of explosive reactive armor. In fact, basically what this consists of is two sheets of steel with the explosives between them. They are fitted in small boxes or blocks on the outside of the tank. And when that block is hit by another high explosive anti-tank projectile, that causes the explosion between the plates to go off and the plates move. And the outside plate goes outwards and eats up the incoming jet. So that really helps improve the survivability of the tank. El M60 también había sido mejorado con un cañón principal británico de 105 milímetros. The 105 main gun can punch through anything that, that we've come across so far on the battlefield. For our three or four basic rounds that, that, that we use, that we actually use right now, number one round is the Sable. And the Sable round is our primary uh, tank killing round. It's nothing more than a depleted uranium projectile that fires out uh, at a speed of 4,850 feet per second. Cruising at a speed this fast, it just crashes through the armor of uh, just about any tank around. And we also have a heat round that stands for high explosive anti-tank. Now the way that works, it impacts on a, on a very small spot on the tank and it shoots a shape charge, it, it focuses the explosive power on a specific point. And to do this, it basically sends a stream of, uh, of, of molten metal through the tank. And as this goes through the tank, it does the same thing. It, it, it heats up the tank and causes internal explosions inside the tank. The greatest strength of the M60 is the crew that operates it. If you get a crew who's knowledgeable and knows how to run the tank, it's going to take you a long ways. And, and that's exactly what it did when we were deployed to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. We had good people over there who knew how to run their tanks, and we came back without a casualty, which, which says a whole lot for us. Inside the turret, you know, it's, it's a scary place to be because you can't see what's coming at you, you know, what's about to hit you. You may be outside for one second, and the minute you drop down to put a round in the breach, you may get hit. You know, it's just something you got to block out of your mind when you come down here. You know, hell, it's like anything else, you know. Uh, every job has hazards. You know, ours are just a little bit more final than others. But, uh... When it's actually taking place, uh, you, you have your job to do. You don't have time to think about it, because if you do, then you're not doing your job. And when you're not doing your job, you're endangering the lives of your other three crewmen. And uh, we don't do that. In the tormenta del desierto, el M60 se enfrentó a adversarios mucho más modernos. El éxito puede ser atribuido al trabajo de equipo y a la camaradería de los hombres que lo operaban. Just a couple hours before we moved out, I had just a, a couple of minutes, and uh, I asked my tank commander, you know, if I could go over to uh, our wingman's tank real quick. And he said, sure, go ahead, just, you know, hurry up back. So uh, it happened to be my best friend. And uh, there has never been an emotion that I felt that would has any, you know, comparison to, uh, you know, saying to him, you know, see you later. You try to downplay it, you know, like, you know, I'll see you later, you know, like that, but will you? You know, you don't know. Actualmente, los principales tanques de batalla poseen un balance entre velocidad y poder. Con las victorias decisivas en el Golfo Pérsico, el estadounidense M1 a 1 Abrams es considerado tal vez el mejor tanque de la historia. Está dotado de un suave cañón de diseño alemán de 120 milímetros capaz de dar al blanco a más de 12 kilómetros de distancia. Es accionado por un motor de turbinas de 1,500 caballos de fuerza, proporcionándole una excelente relación fuerza-peso. The way we used to initially describe the, the Abrams before it was issued to you as a as a crewman or, or in a platoon or, or what have you was that you think you're getting a tank, what you're really getting is a helicopter. It just happens to float on the ground. But think of yourself at that level of speed and capability and what have you. 
El M1 está dotado de un equipo electrónico altamente sofisticado. Posee un cañón totalmente estabilizado, un localizador láser y sistemas de visión nocturna, con solo un comandante, un disparador y un conductor. Our major goal in the development of the Abrams tank uh, was the survivability of, of the individual crewmen. As a group, we were just absolutely uh, convinced that it was our, our mission, our role, our desire to ensure that when mounted soldiers in the tank portion of the mounted battlefield went to battle again, that they would never be put at the kind of disadvantage that the American armored mounted soldier had of World War II in the Sherman tank. El 60% del frente del M1 está cubierto de un blindaje Choban, un material ultra secreto desarrollado por los británicos. El blindaje hace al tanque virtualmente inmune a la mayoría de las armas antitanque. Basically, the actual matrix and the makeup of Choban armor is highly classified and they've never stated what it, what it is. But Chobham armor gives you protection of base against heat attack and also kinetic energy attack. Para proteger a los cuatro miembros del equipo, las municiones se almacenan en compartimientos que explotan hacia el exterior si se dispara al tanque. With a compartmentalized ammunition, then if, if something happens to the ammunition, it goes off and it's expelled to the outside rather than to the inside and, and venting that flame and heat and uh, destruction from our own ammunition to the outside really uh, helps us stay in the tank and then go ahead and fight the tank once yeah. we get resupply. Tal vez la mayor ayuda a la supervivencia es el intenso programa de entrenamiento del equipo que opera los tanques. Se han desarrollado incluso simuladores para entrenamientos en batallas ficticias. La futura generación de tanques es la del M1A2, que será equipada con sistemas electrónicos de visión más avanzados. To run it, I mean, laser and all, and it's really something. I got in the tank, and they showed me how to work the gun and the instrument. I did everything but shoot the gun, and I really got a bang out of it. And I would say that the difference between the M1 main battle tank and the M4 Sherman that we went in Normandy with was as much different as a Model T Ford and a brand new Cadillac. I mean, it was it was awesome difference. Hay muchos grandes tanques de batalla en el mundo actual. El Challenger británico posee un cañón de 120 milímetros y una armadura Chauvin. El Leopardo 2 alemán también posee un cañón de 120 milímetros. Y Rusia posee un T-80 con un cañón de 125 milímetros. La victoria total del Golfo se debió a una coordinación precisa entre las fuerzas aéreas y terrestres, al igual que a la dedicación del equipo que opera los tanques. A lo largo del siglo XX, el tanque pasó de sus torpes comienzos a un logro tecnológico sorprendente en protección, movilidad, armas y poder. Pero durante el cambio, solo una cosa se mantiene constante. 
para obtener la victoria en esta como en todas las guerras y radica en el ingenio de los tácticos y del entrenamiento, dedicación y valor de los soldados. La victoria no es el triunfo de máquinas superiores, sino del espíritu del hombre. <risa> 